Good to see you all friends um, coming here this uh, Sunday evening to practice together. It's such an honor to uh, be able to participate in uh, the Anokampa project. Congratulations to all of you for having now finally a Bikuri monastery in the UK. What an incredible result. <laughs> what an incredible achievement. It really delights my heart and I'm very happy um, to be able to support also Venerable Chanda while she's on retreat and um, that we can all practice together. Uh, so perhaps maybe we can start with a little bit of meditation and then uh, we can talk a little bit of Dhamma. So if that's all right, we can find a comfortable seated position. And when we're ready, we can take a few deep breaths. And close our eyes. We can start by relaxing our entire body from the top of the head to the tip of the toes. Slowly but surely establishing mindfulness and awareness in front of us. Mindfully, we can breathe in. And mindfully, we can breathe out. sharpening our awareness and vigilance with every in-breath and out-breath. Knowing whether it's long or short. whether it's deep or shallow. And it's not important what the breath is like. But what is important is that we know in every moment what the breath is like. Just like we know whether we're hungry or we're full. In the same way, we just know what the breath is like in this moment.
And we can now practice feeling our entire body with every in breath and out breath. without moving our attention around the body. We just practice to feel what this body is like with every in breath and out breath. Get in tune with its heaviness it's consistency, it's texture. That feels no different than a big sack of potatoes that we constantly carry around It is instead this big sack of meat and bones and flesh and muscles and organs. And we can train ourselves to feel it with every in-breath and out-breath. Tranquilizing the entire body with every in breath and out breath. Observing how the more we stay still, the more pleasurable this experience is. And the more pleasurable this experience is, the more still we want to be.
And we every in breath and out breath. We keep tranquilizing this entire body. Like we were ironing out with the breath, every crease we might find, every little tremor, any itchiness. any twitch. We smooth it out with every in-breath and out-breath like it were steam on fabric. Immediately turning everything into soft, pleasant texture. Comfortable to be in. Pleasant to be in. And we can really train ourselves to bring at the foreground of our experience, this pleasantness. With every in breath and out breath. We can feel, see, and increase the pleasant aspect of our experience. This blameless pleasure that comes from the stillness of the body. And we can increase more and more this pleasure and happiness that comes from the stillness of the body. With every in-breath and out-breath. Like we were pumping air in a tire that was deflated. In the same way, every in breath and out breath increases this pleasure and happiness and makes the body more and more still, more and more pleasant to be in.
Remembering to keep a smile on our face. We keep training ourselves to get in tune with this pleasant abiding. With every in-breath and out-breath. Getting more and more comfortable. And supported by the stillness of the body, the pleasantness of the body, we can make also room to feel the texture of the thoughts and emotions in our heart with every in-breath and out-breath. We can calm them down one by one, smoothing anything we find in the heart. Without welcoming it or pushing it away.
leaves the breath like a warm, calming breeze, a warm, calming wind that evens out the surface of the mind, the surface of the heart. Gently blows away what is not needed. Or gently brings to stillness what is moving. doesn't shake anything, doesn't wrestle with things. But keeps this gentleness and loving kindness in the mind and heart to deal with the mind and heart with every in-breath and out-breath. We train ourselves to bring everything to stillness, everything to clarity. Everything to non-reactivity. making room only for the wholesome, and protecting everything from the unwholesome.
and we can come slowly to the end of our meditation practice today by looking at the mind, looking at the heart right now. And seeing what is different from when we first started. Does the mind look clearer, more peaceful, more welcoming, more kind? Is it somewhere we feel comfortable being in? Is there still some resistance? Or some agitation? Some anxiety? whatever we find is okay. It doesn't have to be in anything, any particular way. We can take this as a great opportunity to look at our heart with more clarity with more sincerity and be okay with whatever is there, however it is like. But at the same time, we can encourage ourselves to keep practicing the teachings of the Buddha with the guarantee that we will understand this heart and mind fully. We will understand how suffering comes into being. We will understand what suffering is all about. We will understand how the heart becomes contaminated and we can let go of those contaminations by fully understanding them, fully seeing them. And with this knowledge, with this wisdom, we can bring this suffering to a complete end. for our benefit and the benefit of all sentient beings. With a heart full of gratitude for the Buddha and his Dhamma and the Sangha who has brought these teachings of the Buddha to us today after 2,500 years. With much gratitude for the triple gem, we can slowly bring our hands in Anjali and say together three times sadhu and come slowly out of this meditation practice. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And we can open our eyes and stretch a little bit if we need to.
All right, and we can now pay homage to our original teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha, the reason why we're gathered here today. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Uttam namam sangham namasami It's always a little challenging to start talking after a period of meditation. Just wanted to keep going. <laughs> I don't know about you. <laughs> I have to talk, but you have to listen. Just be silent. <laughs> but oh well, haven't seen uh, all of you in quite some time. <clears throat> about a year or so. <laughs> And a lot of things have happened in, uh, since I last saw uh, all of your friends from Aano Kampa. <laughs> it's been a little bit more exciting than I was hoping for this past year. So a lot of different um, things have, have happened. <laughs> um, it all started actually with uh, my father passing away um, last October. Uh, so I was... In Italy, visiting my uh, my parents um, who hadn't been doing too well after COVID, which is why I've been in the past couple of years um, coming to uh, the old continent more often, um, and um, and the inevitable uh, then happened, uh, which we you know somewhat expected uh you know intellectually as we all expect you know that one day we will die and our loved ones will die and it's part of the first noble truth everything that we love <laughs> is bound to be separated from us uh, so we kind of know you know it's inevitable but then we're always shocked right when it happens um and we're back to square one right so <laughs> the death yeah what a big big messenger the messenger of death uh, and also you know with my parents it's been also the messenger of uh, old age and the messenger of sickness you know all of these uh, three components have been very very um strong in my mind and my heart uh, big topics of contemplation in the past couple of years in particular well actually since forever but <laughs> in particular um in the past couple of years, just to actually see, you know, this distortion of our minds uh, that are that the Buddha tells us, right? The vipalasa that we really, really have this conviction that everything is permanent, even when we, you know, intellectually know it's impermanent. And this is so, so obvious, actually, when it comes to our parents, you know, all of us have, you know, since we've been alive this time around, <laughs> have seen, have had one kind of certainty. It was always there <laughs> until it wasn't anymore, which is our, our parents. So it's actually a very particular, mm, losing one's parents, I have to say, is a very interesting um, moment where we can really, really touch, really feel right this uh distortion of our approach all right so my my dad died uh, last october and uh then we brought him to um his um village where he hadn't lived in uh, several decades so back in his hometown in puglia the hill of italy um there's a little chapel the family tomb uh, where I hadn't been since I was a little girl. So it was actually a very interesting moment. We went all the way there and uh, we brought my uh, my dad there together with, with all the family. And it was quite interesting because I was there with Bhante Sudazo when all of this happened. Um, so Bhante Sudazo, for those who don't know, is a Buddhist monk uh, with whom I, I started Buddhist Insights and every single project, Buddhist project actually, <laughs> Um, that Manoi kindly was talking about earlier on. And um, he's American. So it was 
uh, his first time actually seeing uh, a funeral in Italy, seeing how we bury the dead in Italy, or at least how we did, because uh, how we used to, because uh, things are also impermanent and um, very quickly changing. And so the first thing that he noticed was that when we brought my dad uh, to the, the family tomb, his name was not unique. His name was actually copied and pasted pretty much all over. Half of the <laughs> half of the family tomb had his name already. And um, obviously different pictures, but the family name was um, name and last name was pretty much over there. And then he, you know, my my dad, um, Bantis Sundazo was also familiar with my legal name. And he also find my, found my legal name <laughs> right there in the family tomb, my grandmother. It was just uh, called in the same way that I was called, obviously. And um, he was like, wow, it's what an interesting culture. You, I don't know if you do it also in the UK, but apparently in Italy we've been, um, I had never actually really thought about it, but whenever you bury the dead, you actually bury yourself in a way. <laughs> so you're constantly recollecting death. You're constantly recollecting that at a certain point, you'll also finish right there <laughs> next to your father, next to your grandfather, next to your great-grandfather, or next to your mother, um, grandmother, great-grandmother, and all the uh, the, ancient, the ancestors beforehand. And so it's been, um, yeah, very interesting. Also way before actually bringing him to the family tomb, um, we also have this tradition of keeping the dead in uh, in our home. So for three days, actually, my dad was at home and um, he gave me the biggest, actually, one of the biggest gifts. Um, it was actually quite interesting that he gave me one of the biggest gifts after death. <laughs> so I was um, able for the first time to actually see the, the, the different states of the composition of the body because it was a particularly hot, October, very humid October in Rome. And um, so we have this custom of keeping the body uh, at the home um, for a couple of days, but actually they stretched it a little bit longer because my brothers live, um, live far away. So one was in Indonesia and was coming from Indonesia and the other one was coming from the United States. So there were a few little, um, they couldn't really manage technically speaking, to come in a sort of appropriate manner. So my dad stayed a little bit longer than usual. And also the, the weather was very, very um, intense, very extreme. So there was a very fast decomposition of the body. And well, that was very interesting to watch, I, I shall say. <laughs> very interesting to watch a body that composing in front of in, in front of you over the course of several days and a body that you know really well the body of your father and it occurred to me that actually i had always seen my dad's body decomposing <laughs> since the day i was born it was not only the three days you know of his um actual death but the transformations going through all the pictures that I had seen since I was um, a little girl, all the way to, you know, his, um, he, he died at the age of 80. So he had quite a bit, I had half of his life, I saw it. <laughs> and there were a lot of, a lot of transformations um, throughout. Actually, it was quite hilarious because my mom, um, a few days before he died, we were taking the subway together and my mom now actually suffers from dementia. Speaking of sickness, today Ayasoma has a lot of, <laughs> of stories about um, old age sickness in there. But it was actually like a bit of a tragic comic um, <laughs> episode because my mom was looking at my dad. <laughs> and at a certain point, she's, she goes up to me and she's like, he's so ugly. He used to be so handsome. What happened to him? <laughs> Look at the, that giant head. This was way before he died, right? Like a couple of days before. A giant head. His head used to be so small and good looking and like in the perfect shape. And look, look at that belly. 
<laughs> and she went kind of like, um, you know, through all the parts of the body. <laughs> she did a whole like a full body meditation. And it was quite hilarious because it reminded me of the suttas, you know, these were um, so many different passages. Actually, the Buddha um, talks to the monastics and encourages us to do precisely that, you know, look at any body that we're attracted to. And um, kind of think about how it's going to deteriorate because it's really going to deteriorate. That's without a doubt. And also our body, same thing, right? Actually, really look um, at the nature of this, you know, and what is it that we find so beautiful? Um, is it actually really that beautiful? Right? So um, very interesting. You know, my my mom uh, and dad were very, very good looking folks. <laughs> and they had actually a pretty relatively good life. You know, they've, um, as far as samsara can offer, uh, I feel like that generation, you know, had a bit of struggles, but then also had a kind of, relatively good life and they were pretty good looking and my mom actually at a certain point when she started aging she had a really hard time and she still does she looks at herself and it's like the pirigata of Ambapali, but without the enlightenment part unfortunately <laughs> she also goes throughout her <laughs> her body she's like oh look at this what happened <laughs> my faith got the form <laughs> And look at these arms, they aren't, you know, all plump as they used to be. And, you know, like these teeth, they used to be all polished and nice. And <laughs> it's actually quite charming to see it. But, you know, with the dementia that she uh, developed in the past um, couple of years, there's also so much confusion, so much distress in relation to the body. So sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's really, really painful. Uh, for herself, but also for whoever is around, because this decomposition, this um, all of you know, this natural state of the body, ours and others, the natural state of things, you know, that we're subject to illness and that we're subject to death, right, can be very, very difficult to bear, just in general, but even more so if you have than an illness like dementia that makes you even more confused, right? So she has these moments of really, really extreme suffering. And what really um, made an impression on me was when she came um, a while back to uh, the United States with me. At a certain point, uh, she had a moment of lucidity. And uh, she came up to me and she was like, oh, uh, Ayasoma. Well, actually, she didn't say Ayasoma. She likes to use my birth name. <laughs> um, she said, yeah, daughter, you know, like, I just so wished that when I was younger, I had asked myself some good questions and had actually um, really looked at developing in essence, basically a spiritual practice, really looking at these existential questions, uh, really um, really trying to understand what is the point of all of this? What is this, um, what is this body? What is this mind? Uh, what am I doing <laughs> with my life, right? And uh, she said, because it would have prepared me to deal with my current state of things right now, which is very, very difficult to bear. And I found it really beautiful because, um, you know, my parents weren't too happy when I ordained or actually when I became a Buddhist and uh, I left everything behind even before I formally ordained. So they had a lot, a lot of struggle and difficulties. And um, even though we were, you know, born in Italy, which is a Catholic country, my parents were both um, pretty secular and uh, materialist. So they, they gave us lots of, you know, good conditions. And they were very, really good parents. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, all of these questions were set aside, you know? Um, because once again, as I said, they, they're they pretty good looking. So they're like, okay, well, this body is quite nice and reliable. <laughs> they had relatively good health. Uh, my mom up until her latest disease uh, was not taking any, any type of medicine, you know, up until the age of 77 or so, 28. She had zero medicine. Wow, 
quite quite impressive, right? So yeah, all of these factors kind of can make us even more intoxicated than usual. This is what the Buddha tells us, right? We are intoxicated with youth. We are intoxicated with uh, health. We're intoxicated with life. So yeah, they didn't have a formal addiction that we uh, normally send, uh, have, you know, treatment facilities, <laughs> rehab facilities these days. Um, but they have some really serious, like we all do, actually, but some really serious addictions that if we don't realize that we're actually addicted to them, then it can be, we can go to a really bad destination. It can be very, very, very difficult. It's always difficult, but even more so. And so my parents have been teaching me even more, right? I feel like my my family right now, it's uh, literally the four messengers. <laughs> messenger of old age, sickness, death. And then there's the fourth messenger, the monastic. <laughs> like, hmm, <laughs> I see you, Mara. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, working on this um, <laughs> Uh, security plan, insurance plan, <laughs> the real insurance plan that we can actually rely upon, which is the Noble Eightfold Path, which is practicing the teachings of the Buddha. But not only, you know, as a monastic, of course, all of us, it doesn't matter whether we are monastics or lay people. Uh, the important thing is having the teachings and really uh, accepting this invitation from the Buddha to, to look, to understand why these messengers are so, so important. Um, why they're actually divine messengers and not some kind of random dude that, that is <laughs> stopping by and how actually these were the understanding of old age, sickness and death and also how we relate to them. You know, it's beautiful to see how the Buddha actually before going forth um, it was these reflections. It's really also seeing how the mind can create a conceit of superiority towards others when we're not in that condition. So when we're intoxicated with health, right? And we're like, hmm, you know, person who has dementia. Ugh. That's disgusting. That's gross. Or a person who, yeah, has kind of any type of disability, right? That we are not experiencing in that moment can be very normal to have that, ugh, gross. I don't want to look at that, right? So that intoxication, with our own health, our very precarious <laughs> state of health and of that moment, right? Until we actually happen to, to have that same um, situation, that same disease, or maybe someone who we love very much has that same disease, right? It was very interesting, actually, when my mom came to the United States, because at the very beginning, she didn't speak, um, see, since she doesn't speak English, at the very beginning, people you know, we're just relating to her as, oh, she's Ayasoma's mom. <laughs> what a sweet old lady. And then you see her point the rumor that my mom had um, suffered from dementia, started circulating, and people were a little bit like weirded out around her. <laughs> so they weren't <laughs> like that affectionate and outgoing anymore. But they were kind of like, oh, ugh, this person mm, makes me a little bit uncomfortable. It was actually very beautiful because some people really came out saying that I have a lot of discomfort because of this. I don't know why. I, I'm i really afraid of this disease. I don't want to see this disease, right? So that's normally how we deal with a disease and actually with old age, sickness and death these days. <laughs> contemporary contemporary society, you know, puts um, old age in a nursing home, <laughs> sickness in a hospital <laughs> or somewhere, you know, very far away. and. Um, Death, well, there are these like very clean funeral homes. So then they there's no messengers. Then we're in this deluded. <laughs> there's no divine messengers. There are only deluded maras um, everywhere where we can get very, very once again conceited very much. We don't have this opportunity to look at that. So what a beautiful thing when we actually do have um, messengers around us that also make us notice this um, this difficulty, you know. Also for myself, it's been very interesting to have a mom uh, with uh, such a, 
really difficult disease, actually, in so many ways, right? Also see even myself and also my thought of myself, you know, like, oh, I'm a monastic, Buddhist, Buddhist monastic, I should be practicing this, this, and this other way, right? I should be thinking in this and this other way, should be feeling in this and this other way. But then uh, it can be a little bit different, right? The experience, we can um, start there can be a bit of a volcano happening um, of so many different things that we don't ex expect. And that's the beauty actually of being supported, right? By the fourth messenger, which is not Ayasoma, which is not, you know, the monastic per se, but actually uh, the renunciation that the, the, the renunciation path, the Noble Eightfold Path that the Buddha is teaching us. So to be supported by his teachings, to be supported by um, this practice of knowing of purifying, of letting go, of re renouncing, and of cultivating wholesome qualities, right? So then through this, in this way, when we welcome the three messengers, the three divine messengers, we can be supported by the fourth messenger to, uh, to welcome them properly, deal with them properly, and transcend them properly, right? So it's a, a whole practice. And this is a little bit actually why uh, Manori then said that there's also empty cloud Italia <laughs> right now. So now what happened in all of this, in all of these adventures is that um, then it was even more clear to me um, that, you know, having to come a little bit more often to Italy and probably actually having to be here on sort of regular basis, more close to my mom, um, there had to be uh, you know, sort of, we had to welcome the fourth messenger. We had to welcome a place for practice for for myself or other bikunis. Uh, there's no bikuni monastery in Italy, and um, you know, I feel like my my dad also helped send some kind of also fourth messenger after his death <laughs> because this uh, big fourth materialized um, <clears throat> when we brought him to the. Um, to the family tomb right in uh, in the village where he's from so an over 100 acres of forest uh, sort of popped out out of nowhere and um we kind of <laughs> uh, jumped at the opportunity to kind of try and create uh, the conditions for for this project to to come into being so so yes so now we have um <laughs> there's been a fundraiser and uh uh, and the generous loans. So the organization, the new newborn Empty Cloud Italy, <laughs> just um, purchased in in July uh, this land. Uh, so for the past two months, it's been quite interesting. I've been living off the grid because <laughs> um, it's literally <clears throat> there's no water, no current, no running water, no electricity, no nothing. So it's been an interesting vata. And now I'm here visiting my mom. That's why I'm on the grid, <laughs> as you can see, <laughs> with lights and everything. I'll be returning uh, back tomorrow, uh, back then. But yeah, you know, it's, um, it's so much gratitude, right? To have the teachings of the Buddha and be able to share the teachings of the Buddha. You know, it's been also seeing my mom when she was welcomed at Empty Cloud USA, uh, how she was supported, even though people were struggling sometimes, as I as I was mentioning before, but also having this kind of wide web community of practitioners. So we're all cultivating the wholesome. We're all um, trying to practice towards uh, the end of suffering, and how that was easing her suffering. That was um, being so uh, so much support, even without any type of um, kind of proper communication because she doesn't speak English and doesn't really understand English. So I was like, well, you know, the, the answer to all of this dukkha, right? When, you know, kind of your family explodes and you're a monastic, what are you going to do? <laughs> There's two options if you're unenlightened. Uh, either feel more sorry for yourself and make more dukkha. <laughs> and it's kind of like a little bit illogical, right? There's enough dukkha in the, in the world. So also the monastic start putting more dukkha. It's, really too much to bear right or we um go, go out and kind of see well this is actually the inevitability this is what the buddha is talking about this is the first noble truth this is why we practice so the answer the solution is the same for all of us so there has to be more places for practice there have to be more conditions uh for people to um 
practice at different levels of renunciation to where they are, you know, whether they're monastics or lay people. And so this has been a little bit the the kind of um, what I've been working on for for the the past um, year is to yeah uh, create conditions that are beneficial for myself, my mom, hopefully, <laughs> uh, and all sentient beings here. So hopefully soon you can also come and visit us uh, at the Hill of Italy in Acquaviva. It's very close to Bari. Uh, we're in. In the middle of nowhere, but we're close to an airport, the airport of body. So uh, you're all welcome to come when we get a little bit more on the grid, hopefully next year at some point. And um, yeah, may all beings attain awakening, including ourselves. So this has been a little bit of a rambling talk, but if anyone has any questions or thoughts. If you raise your hand, I can unmute you. I see Darren. Thank you, Isa. Um, thank you so much um, for the meditation and also for sharing um, your journey over over the last year. And um, I'm going to try and hold it together. <laughs> my, um, um, my my ex wife's mum, who I'm still really very close with, she's um, had. A dramatic turn in health over the last five months and um it's been really difficult to accept um and she's now talking about palliative care um and she is um not for this she's a greek orthodox um so i think probably similar similar to a certain degree um with italian culture but it's just the acceptance that she's having and um the gratitude that she's been given the time to say um her her goodbyes um and um just the reminder that everything isn't isn't permanent um and that um yeah sickness and death um and health come come to us and come to us all um so it's been i've just been really grateful hearing that journey and i suppose my question is um uh, actually, before I say that, um, when you were talking, it just reminded me a lot of um, Ajahn Pramali's Death Contemplation Meditation um, and, um, and and gratitude uh, and how I want to be with her. Uh, but also, I don't know where my last breath is, but she, she could outlive me. I could drive home uh, and um, get hit by a bus. Um, so I, I don't know what, what's going to bring me. Um, what's going to happen in the future but I suppose if there's any specific um, uh, meditations or readings and uh, suttas that could um, help one through that please thank you so much Darren uh, thank you for well having such a beautiful heart and speaking so um, directly yeah I'm very sorry that you're going through this it is it is difficult you know there's a lot of uh, anukampa right now in my heart literally and figuratively <laughs> anukampa literally means um trembling together so uh it's one of my favorite pali words precisely because of that right so it's uh you know this uh, definition of compassion and we actually understand that our suffering is not not different than the suffering of others and that we're all in this uh, sinking ship together <laughs> sometimes it can feel very isolating um when we yeah we don't we're not aware once again when there is that disconnect between you know the our intellectual understanding of old age sickness and death and the actual reality of old age, sickness, and death. And, you know, sickness, we've all been sick. There's not one person 
that has not been sick. But we're always surprised whenever we get sick or whenever someone close to us gets sick, right? <laughs> old age, also, we, we know that we're supposed to get old, <laughs> yet we're, yeah, we're so, um, tell you a funny story, actually, because I moved uh, to the United States in 2008. Now that I'm back in Italy in 2024, I've noticed another very interesting aspect of the mind uh, that is very fossilized in permanence. So I see all the old people as um, if they were born in, like they were my grandparents' age, so born in the 1950, 1915 or 1920. <laughs> and I see people my age, like the sort of age of my parents. <laughs> And I still like I get into a sort of phase where I look at like people who are there in their 20s and I feel like they're my age, but then they relate to me in a different way. I'm like really confused. It doesn't happen to me in the United States, but it happens to me in Italy. Then I'm like so confused why, you know, elderly people, you know, have Alexa. I'm like, wait, nope. <laughs> why are you using Amazon? This is really bizarre. <laughs> right? Or people, um, that are supposedly my parents' age, who are my age, that, you know, educate, you know, children in a very weird contemporary way, like the Americans. <laughs> so there's this very, there's fixation, there's a fossilization um, of things, a um, very self-centered way of, I'm realizing, of perceiving, perceiving the reality. But when we actually kind of understand this, see the naturality of it, and see how everybody else has the same struggles, how we we all have vipalaza, this distortion of view, how we all, you know, um, experience, we perceive the impermanent as permanent, how we're all struggling, you know, of, of being connecting with so many people that have, for example, a loved one who is facing dementia or someone who has um, just um, been struggling with, uh, you know, the sickness of their parents, taking care of parents. There's so many monastics right now, you know, it's like this big disease also of um, uh, the monastic parents were, and then the monastic actually starts taking out the parents. Uh, Aya Brahmavara, one of uh, your British bikunis in the UK is currently doing that. She's um, taking care of her parents in, in the UK and there are plenty also throughout the world, right? So, there's, you start opening up and you're like, wow, I am not alone. I am not alone. And there are people who are struggling with all of this right now with me here. I can see them or I can feel them. And it's been like that um, since discoverable beginning. <laughs> right that's why the buddha taught the dhamma it wasn't any different 2500 years ago we have plenty of um stories in the suttas uh, plenty of evidence you know of monastics and lay people going through these difficulties so it's clearly you know the the state this is why the dhamma works for everyone this is why the, the dhamma is timeless so it's because the disease is, is timeless, you know, old age is timeless, <laughs> sickness is timeless, death is timeless. Um, I would say that these days it's particularly difficult, maybe, uh, because we have this sanitized way of, of dealing with old age, sickness and death, as we were saying earlier. So it can be particularly tricky. You know, I couldn't, uh, even as monastics, we don't have easy access to do corpse contemplation, for example, <laughs> very difficult. It's illegal in the, in the West to have <laughs> a corpse or to even keep bones. You can't, you can't keep bones. Well, luckily in Europe, actually, because of the Catholic, um, or, you know, because of our history, we have a lot of, at least in, in Italy, we, we have lots of, uh, actually even churches made, made of bones, but in the United States, you can only have a plastic skeleton. So once again, it's, <laughs> It's a very intellectual exercise. And um, I was reading a while back, actually, um, uh, something that was written by this Catholic, uh, Catholic monk who was pointing out how for the first time in human history, people want to die 
while sleeping, unconscious. It's very, very interesting. The majority of us want to die <laughs> unconscious. And he was pointing out, I was, this is the first time in history because up until uh, recently for basically history as we know it, um, that was considered the worst way to die <laughs> when you were not aware, right? So actually most of one's life was um, dedicated to learning how to die. So one would live one's life to learn how to die. Isn't it interesting? <laughs> and these days we actually, um, instead of, you know, because when we actually learn how to die, we, we put value to life. We really don't waste time, right? We really understand what is important. We don't put too much time in quarreling and, um, you know, uh, being bitter and this and that, because we, we know we have very little time. We start practicing more the teachings of the Buddha. We uh, don't have time for, you know, all sorts of time wasting uh, sort of uh, situations, right? So uh, we learn how to die, but we also learn through that how to live. And so when we forget how to learn how to die, then we just start consuming our lives, right? We are in a consumerist society, so we're constantly consuming everything. And this is what makes everything, I think, even more painful because then it just, it's shocking. It comes out of the blue. So my suggestion to, to your question is just once again, really um, take on the contemplation of death. There's nothing special to read except for the teachings of the Buddha, which are super special. <laughs> Um, but I wouldn't go into any particular sutta, uh, sorry, any particular book that is not the suttas, but I would go back to the original teachings of the Buddha. And um, yeah, just really look. Also, once again, as I was saying earlier, really what I find beautiful is also what pushed the, the Buddha to go for, forth, to also look at that, you know, uh, all of our feelings, towards death towards the dying and also see how ridiculous is that right his reflection that he goes well i too am subject to old age sickness and death so it would be very bizarre if i felt superior if i felt disgusted or if i felt you know in any kind of shape or form um in regards to to this right if i too am subject of all of these things and another thing that I find really helpful is also making lots of merits and dedicating it to the departed. Like, you know, <laughs> the Buddha also recommends uh, that to the, the monastics in general, you know, like he recommends it to everybody. It's like, monastics, do not be afraid of merit. Merit is a synonym of happiness. So all this merit, you know, it was making me really happy, for example, to... Um, start this monastery and dedicating it, dedicating all the, the actions that I've been doing, all the effort to my parents, to my dad, to my mom, to my grandparents, to, yeah, all sentient beings. And whew, even saying it now, like, oh, I feel so much better. So it's not necessarily, I would say, contemplation of death, just like doom and gloom <laughs> like i'm the subject of, you know all my loved ones but also doing um these beautiful acts you know like thinking well anything all the contributions also recollecting all the contributions that you've done perhaps for anukampa uh bikuni project incredible you know so many people are benefiting from that and also the departed can uh benefit from that also the people right so pushing for a good rebirth also for for the departed and going like yeah yeah there's more places for practice there's yes a climate apocalypse maybe in the future reborn birth but with lots more <laughs> a lot of more dhamma <laughs> so that is good and makes us all much more cheerful thank you so much thank you so much thank you sorry, sorry, sorry. thank you I'll unmute Benjamin. Hello. Um, I don't really have a question. It's just to say thank you very much, really, because um, 
I am. Um, I'm living here with my 95 year old grandmother who has dementia. So it was um, very helpful to hear your reflections on some other similar scenario and how you approach that. And also myself, I am. Um, I've had very poor health for almost all my life, and it's about as bad now as it's ever been. And when you were explaining about uh, how we can get conceited with our good health or with our good looks or whatever it is, and that can uh, create this like, feeling of superiority, I had this feeling like a cloud dispersed because I just felt uh, my my being sick had benefited me. Um, because I don't think I'd be interested in Buddhism if I hadn't been ill as a young person, you know. So it's, uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Benjamin, keeping you in my heart. <laughs> Matcha Nukampa also for you. Um, one thing that I would say uh, is also what I found very interesting about dealing with um with my mom's dementia, because there were times where it was really, really challenging and difficult, uh, was actually joining some um, some of those support groups for caregivers. And uh, it was such an incredible teaching of anatta. It still is. Uh, I learned that, for example, any person who suffers from dementia, it doesn't matter if they're in Italy, if they're in the United States, if they are in India, if they are... Uh, you name it, in New Zealand, wherever they are in the world, whatever language they speak, at a certain point, they will all say, I want to go home. <laughs> it is so, so interesting, even while they are at home, and you're like, wait, what? How is this possible? <laughs> and um, apparently, what it means is that they want to go to a place, usually their childhood, they didn't have a traumatic childhood, but anyway, a kind of situation, um, which normally is uh, the home where they felt safe. So, for example, for my mom, it's definitely when she was a little girl and her parents were, uh, were taking care of her and she didn't have to worry about a thing. And so there's that kind of feeling. It's not necessarily the environment, but it's going back to going back to that kind of place. And then what I also found was, um, you know, all the challenges that caregivers have. <laughs> that, you know, when we are by ourselves dealing with someone um, who has such a an intense, um, yeah, illness like that one, can be really maddening, it can be really difficult. The, the person can be... Uh, well, there are some that actually, some folks that are very relaxed and chill, but some others, my mom is a little bit on the latter rather than the former. She's, she can be a little bit aggressive. It's good that she's a little bit short, <laughs> not too strong. <laughs> but yeah, she can be very fiery, you know, Southern Italian woman. <laughs> so um, not happy with her, her illness. So, whew very very difficult very challenging to deal with that and so that also you know once again can also bring up so many different difficulties uh, at a certain point i hadn't slept um for 10 days and i started having suicidal thoughts because i was uh, i was trying to um, i had a bit of a delirium of omnipotence and i thought that just by <laughs> <laughs> taking care of my mom 24 7 I was going to cure her of uh, the the illness but it didn't um after three months I understood that <laughs> there are certain things that are are not possible or not in my domain of of capabilities but anyway it was very interesting because after 10 days of not sleeping at a certain point my mind started producing suicidal thoughts and I was like wow this is really very interesting because I, I don't want to commit suicide but my mind is producing suicidal thought. And then I started noticing that every person who did the same thing, which is very common, would start producing that. So we got to see dependent origination in, <laughs> in a very direct way. Anatta, so the impersonality of all these things and the impersonality of our situation and also dependent origination in the way that whenever there are these conditions, coming into being, then this is the result that appears. And whenever you remove these conditions, this result disappears. So then also dealing with someone who has a severe illness can get us to also 
uh, teach us a lot about how we deal with the situation, uh, what are the conditions that produce wholesome thoughts, what are the conditions that produce unwholesome thoughts, and we can start, I mean, obviously it's a very extreme, um, <laughs> extreme situation, but also our vulner vulnerability, you know, I also learned how to ask for help. I was like, okay, I can't do this. Okay, I need to help. I need help. And seeing how pretty much every caregiver who deals with uh, someone who suffers from dementia uh, suffers, goes through burnout, suffers through all these uh, senses of guilt, suffers through all these, yeah, all of these different different dynamics. Uh, so what an incredible teaching. Everything is Dhamma, as they say, and it's it truly is. So I hope... Um, Yes, I hope all will be well with uh, with you and uh, and your mom and yes and your grandma. Sorry, and uh, yeah, everything is such a when we really reflect on it, it's such a like fuel for for dhamma practice. Like we really understand how lucky we are, and now we're like, yeah, if we're reborn and we don't have the dhamma, this is gonna be a lot more serious, a lot more difficult to to bear. <laughs> There is a there is a message in the chat. Uh, uh, Aya, do you want me to read it if it is difficult with the mobile? Yes, please. That would be lovely. Thank you. It says, beautiful talk. I'm deeply moved. It's also so typical. Sorry. It's also so topical at the moment as I watch my parents go into their 90th, 90th years. I feel that I'm in a waiting room. It also simplifies everything to what really matters. So happy for your Vihara. Much metta. Oh, Sato. <laughs> Thank you for all your good wishes. And yes, very important to have community. Um, I definitely, you know, realized one thing. One thing I learned from the explosion of my nuclear family is that the nuclear family can be a little bit radioactive. <laughs> so... <laughs> We need to, uh, yeah, be very quite aware of that. Even the most beautiful nuclear family, it's still very few people. So inevitably, I feel like the modern society that we got in ourselves involved with <laughs> has a lot, a lot, a lot of problems, a lot of um, drawbacks, a lot of flaws, and um, very important to to have a Dhamma community, more Dhamma communities where we can all support each other skillfully. So we're also planning on doing lots of work also with uh, the elderly and um, people with uh, yeah, cognitive um, disorders and um, yeah, supporting a little bit, uh, whoever, whoever we can. Uh, so yeah, may that also happen in the UK and everywhere, which I'm sure will happen. You're all such great people. So Dharma practitioners, lovely, lovely people. We're really blessed. Okay. I don't know if there's any other reflections or if we, well, maybe we're almost out of time. <laughs> have three minutes, but maybe Manori, you wanted to say a few words before. Yes, thank you very much, Ayasoma. Um, it is um, such a difficult but very important topic, uh, especially in the West. We don't talk about these things now. As you know, we have hospitals for the sick and uh, care homes for the um, you know, elderly and uh, funeral homes for the uh, dead people. I'm I'm from Sri Lanka, and I have we have that three days, you know, a body stays in the three days thing. At so you see the dead bodies as they are, um, and then you see the impermanence. And uh, but here, you just go to the funeral. You don't see a body. It's just a nice box, and you're far away. And uh, um. You don't have that 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 feeling, that connection, that time to contemplate. So thank you very much for bringing that and uh, um, giving us opportunity to discuss this question and understand it 
deeper as well. And uh, I'm sure many of us will go and reflect on this. And um, as you know, ISOMA is in Italy these days and um, uh, you can have a look at um, the Empty Cloud Italia. Uh, there's a Facebook page. Um, ISOMA is active in the Instagram as well. Um, I follow you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, so you, as you know, today's teachings are for on a donation basis and in spirit of generosity. Um, so you can you can see um, uh, the Anukampa Bikuni project and um, uh, Empty Cloud Italia as well. And uh, so when talking about Anukampa Bikuni project. We provide these kind of teachings, uh, these valuable Dhamma talks, teachings, meditation retreats, and all these talks are in Anukampa Bikuni project um, uh, web uh, YouTube channel. Um, and if you are able to, um, we gratefully receive any financial donation. Um, thank you. Uh, you can see uh, the Empty Cloud Italia link as well as Anukampa project organization donation link uh, there in the chat box. Uh, so I invite you if you are able uh, to um, uh, have a look at the Anukampa, uh, have a look at the Empty, Empty Cloud Italia if you haven't uh, seen that and see what I is doing. And also um, uh, come and have a look at the Anukampa website um, and if you are able to financially support, uh, please support us because as Ayasoma uh, mentioned, we are in a new monastery and uh, changing a property into a monastery is a, is a big task. So that is where we are. Thank you very much. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And I see Janaki, good to see you. <laughs> I don't know from where in the world. <laughs> Andrea, so it's so nice to see you again. Um, but I heard that you are, you will be coming back to New Jersey. Yes, uh, October sixteenth. Um, but I'm not quite sure for how long. It depends on my brother how long he's staying with my mom. <laughs> Oh, I see. Yeah, because everybody is looking forward to your visit. That's why. Oh. <laughs> and I'm back in New Zealand. Ah, oh, okay, lovely. Yeah, and yes, about two months now. Very good. Very good. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, good to see you, Spain and um, in Italia. Uh, in Italy, the empty cloud. I mean, is it? Uh, do you usually practice all this? kinds of, you know, the discussions and suttas and meditation right now? We will. Um, it's just that we've done more teachings outside because right now the place is a little bit um, too intense for most people because <laughs> uh, it's uh, literally off the grid. It's great for forest practice, uh, for austerities, great for samadhi. Great for renunciation, um, but it can be a little bit too much for, <laughs> uh, for yeah, um, people to come because yeah, there's um, the main building is is not like Anukampas, <laughs> it's uh, fallen apart, so it has to it needs to be renovated entirely. So there's not a structure, there's no bathrooms, there's nothing. So. Uh, we haven't started the programming there, but we, we've been doing our usual programming outside in Italian for now. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Ah, Shirin. Hello. Shirin is actually Italian. <laughs> Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for um, this offering tonight. Um, I've infiltrated here. So um, the person who just spoke mentioned the Italian Sangha and I just wanted to come on and say hi because I haven't seen you in a in a bit. Um, and also, yeah, just some representation from, from Italy. 
Uh, but thank you so much. And this is a lovely, lovely space. It's the first time for me attending. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Sadhu. Yes, you should always attend, especially if so when Venerable Chanda will come back. Shirin is one of the few Italians who speaks Italian. <laughs> Sorry, speaks English. <laughs> also Italian, hopefully. <laughs> speaks English really fluently. So you have access, Shirin, to lots of great re resources. And Anukampa Bikuni Project is um, is one of them. Definitely much better when Ayasoma is not around and Venerable Chamna is, <laughs> is around. So check it out to make sure. Yeah, I've noticed the programming uh, looks really good. So thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Ayasoma. Sadhu. And thank you very much, everyone. And I will unmute you to say goodbye.